Hey there, my name is Brandon Evans and I'm a course author and instructor with the SANS Institute. I wanted to take a moment to talk about one of the resources that I published on sans.org slash cloud, which is the secure service configuration in AWS, Azure, and GCP poster. This poster is based on the course that Eric Johnson and I authored called Sec510 Cloud Security Controls and Mitigations. One of my favorite parts of this course is that at the end of most of our modules, we have a comparison table. And this shows us the differences between services in AWS, Azure, and GCP. We compare analogous services to show how security capabilities in one do not necessarily map to another. That's why we like to say in our course that multiple clouds require multiple solutions. So we took the summary tables there, every single one of them, and we combined them with our benchmarks that we've either developed internally or borrowed from the Center for Internet Security, CIS benchmarks for the big three cloud providers, and we've consolidated them into this digital poster. You can download this poster, which is quite long, 22 pages long, or you can get the printable version and print it out for reference. I've got my copy over here. It's uh, quite large. If you can see this on the uh, recording without the uh, virtual background, it's double-sided and there's a lot of content here, but there's a whole lot more content on the digital version because we had a lot more space. So let's talk about some of the items that are on this poster. So we have our table of contents and we'll talk about our course a little bit, as well as the benchmark versions that we use. But the first real part to look at is this page five over here, in which we talk about the instance metadata service. And the instance metadata service is a very important service in all three of the cloud providers, because this service can be used to access credentials for an EC2 instance or an Azure virtual machine or a Google Cloud virtual machine. And using those credentials, you can potentially escalate your privileges, potentially to the point that you can take over the entire account. This is not only important from a confidentiality perspective, but it also matters for integrity and availability. And one of the benchmarks that we referenced here from the MITRE ATT&CK Cloud Matrix, we referenced this technique called 1496, which talks about how you can use these credentials in order to consume cloud resources for malicious purposes, such as cryptocurrency mining, distributed denial of service attacks, or password cracking. Anything that you'd wanna do as an attacker, but that you wouldn't wanna necessarily pay for. Now, who here wants to have their organization pay for cybercrime? No? Well, then you should probably follow the assessment criteria that we have provided here. The first one is that you should turn off the IMDS if the infrastructure does not need to access cloud managed resources. We should also turn off access to legacy versions of the IMDS. In general, your applications are gonna need some access to these credentials, but there are less secure versions of these IMDSs one of which, in the case of AWS, actually caused or helped cause the Capital One breach in 2019. The Capital One breach, huge breach if you haven't heard about it. So there are several things we can do to lock down this IMDS by using the latest version, as well as limit our amount of hops that we can make at the IP level. So we can have a network level control for AWS as well. And we talk more about that in the course. So when we compare these different services, we can see that the first version of the AWS instance metadata service has some very significant limitations in terms of it does not have protection against a relatively simple OWASP top 10 issue called server-side request forgery or SSRF, whereas the other ones do. However, with IMDS v2, we do have SSRF protection, as well as that network level protection that prevents extraction of our credentials. One other thing I'm going to highlight here is that Azure has a token scope. What that means is that the token is specific to a particular resource. So you have to generate a different credential for Azure storage 
and another set of credentials for Azure's Key Vault. Whereas in AWS and GCP, if you have the credentials, you can access any service that you're authorized to access based on IAM policies. We also talk extensively about IAM policies. First and foremost, you should follow the CIS benchmark 1.18, which says to use IAM roles with instance profiles in order to ensure that you're not using hard-coded credentials. Long-lived credentials are worse than short-lived ones, but short-lived credentials can still be exploited. The ones that you get from the IMDS are still short-lived, but we should use short-lived where possible. And we also need to eliminate the administrative access that a lot of these users or services may have. Not only the built-in administrative access policy, but also any other policy that has star star. Then we talk a little bit about the differences of the features we have here. AWS is quite flexible in that it has both policies that you can attach to a principle or policies that you can attach to a resource. Whereas Azure is all about principle policy and GCP is all about resource policy. However, there are some limitations to what you can bind a GCP policy to. You can't bind it to every kind of resource. Sometimes you have to bind it at the project level, which can be very problematic and does not follow the principle of least privilege. On that subject, one of the most important things to know about GCP is that GCP has editor permissions on its default service account which means that if you compromise a single virtual machine in Google Cloud and that virtual machine has not been reconfigured from the default, that means that you can potentially take over the entire Google Cloud project, excluding that you cannot modify IAM permissions. But you can launch new VMs, delete all of the data, and much more. We also talk a lot about multi-cloud identity federation at the end of the course, which is how you can use identities in one cloud provider to authenticate to other cloud providers. And one of the things to mention is that as of right now, Azure does not have a mechanism of trusting AWS signature V4 tokens, which means that it is impossible for AWS credentials to be used to access Azure resources, but all the other integrations are supported. Moving on to some network controls and comparisons, it's very important that we do not use the default network resources and policies that exist in all three of the cloud providers because they are overall quite wide open. In AWS and Azure, when you launch a brand new virtual machine, it's going to have you create a custom set of security groups, which is going to optionally allow you to allow administrative access. And while AWS pushes you in that direction by automatically enabling those connections, it also has a big warning box that says, hey, this rule that we pre-populated, you probably shouldn't use it. In comparison, GCP has some issues communicating its network rules, let's say. Their default VPC allows SSH and RDP from the internet, and there's not a whole lot of indication of this when you're launching a virtual machine, which makes it so that a lot of people don't realize that these administrative ports are open by default, even before you launch your first virtual machine. That's on the prevention side. We also talk a little bit about the monitoring side. And the only way to enable your folks that are working in threat detection to analyze your network is to enable network flow logging. And the most important thing on this slide is that network flow logging is not enabled by default. You have to explicitly turn it on. We also talk a little bit about how we can enable folks on premises to access our cloud resources, and we compare the different services that enable that. We have two modules on cryptography, where we talk about cryptographic key management, as well as how to leverage these keys properly. And what's important to know is that there are single tenant options and multi-tenant options. And currently AWS and Azure support single tenant, whereas GCP does not. 
And that might be an issue from a compliance perspective. For me, I love working in multi-tenant environments because that's what the cloud was designed for. And I think if you're worried about having your keys co-mingle with other customers' keys, then you'll be really scared to learn about how your data is oftentimes co-mingling with other customers' data. So that's something you definitely wanna be aware of, but there's a whole lot of additional information here. For the sake of time, I'm gonna move on to talk a little bit about using these cryptographic keys in order to encrypt your data in the cloud. In general, we argue that you should encrypt all data at rest and in transit because it's fairly easy to set up. All you have to do is designate what key you want to use for encryption and decryption purposes, and it goes to work. It's really just that simple in the vast majority of cases in all three cloud providers. We also talk a lot about storage in this course. And I know that most people understand that things like S3 and Azure Storage and Google Cloud Storage need to be locked down. They can't be public, but there's a lot of other considerations, such as preventing public access at an account level or a bucket level, integrity and availability controls, and much, much more. So it's a lot more advanced than just those basics. We've got a lot of details here about those configurations, as well as different data exfiltration paths and tools that you can use like Amazon Macy, uh, Microsoft Purview, and Google Cloud's data loss prevention service in order to detect sensitive data detection and uh, loss. We also talk about serverless. A lot of the concepts apply to all different compute instances in the cloud providers, but serverless is oftentimes looked over. So definitely recommend checking out this criteria as well. At the end of the poster, we talk a little bit about the lab environment that we have in SEC 510. This is for this fictional healthcare company called Nimbus Immutable. And yes, it's pronounced Immutable. It's a Spanish word. It's not immutable, something that a lot of people uh, think is a typo in our courseware. And this website uses a lot of different resources, way more resources than you would expect for such a simple application that only has a handful of features, such as being able to read your electronic medical records, pay your bill, request new prescription refills, as well as upload secure medical documents and things along those lines. And yet when we look at this slide, we see so many different services that we use in this lab environment and talk about in our course, be it compute services or the vast, vast list of platform as a service resources that we integrate our infrastructure as a service offerings with. So lots of different services are covered in this class and are covered in this poster, as well as we have a lot of other related resources that you can find at the end of this poster. So I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation of this poster, and I really hope that you'll take the opportunity to download it and use it as a quick reference. Where can you find it? Well, you can find it on sans.org slash cloud, which will automatically redirect to sans.org slash cloud dash security. Here is where we have all of our resources in the curriculum, be it webcasts or cheat sheets or posters, details about our courses and our certifications and much more. And I really hope that you'll take advantage of these free resources. We put them out there so that you can use them we hope that we'll have you in our various courses, such as SEC 510, but we want to make sure the community gets a taste of all of this great content as well. So please take advantage of these free resources here. And you can find this poster in the posters and cheat sheets section. If you like this presentation or are interested in this content, I would definitely recommend checking out my course, which is SEC 510 Cloud Security Controls and Mitigations, which covers all of the different controls that you can use to prevent real attacks from happening. Not just focus, focusing on compliance, but also focusing on the real attacks that matter to your organization. We'll show you the exact controls that you need in order to prevent these attacks, and we'll show you how those controls greatly differ between the different cloud providers. If nothing else, 
please, please, please click on this course demo button, which will give you a free hour of content from this course that you can access just by having a free sans.org account. And there's a whole hour of additional content. The section that we have demoed here is on the instance metadata service, which I mentioned initially is very, very important. So I hope you'll take the opportunity to learn more about these cloud security controls and mitigations by taking SEC 510. And I hope you'll take advantage of the free poster that I just demonstrated. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful day.